My name is Ekaterina Nova, and I'm going to be talking about universities and the future of innovation. Now, we've all heard to death that the world is changing at an unprecedented pace. One of the ways we'll see this is that, on average, every person in this room will work seven jobs in their lifetime. I myself have worked 11. To my defense, they've mo been mostly small contract work, but 11 is a lot. The previous generations would work one or two jobs in one career path, where we're expected to work at least two career switch careers at least once. Uh, the jobs we work also require a much greater interaction with technology than ever before. To give you an example, a uh, Travel agent in the 1950s and 1960s would have pretty much the same interaction with technology throughout their careers. Now, there were small changes, and of course, policies change and paperwork changes, but overall, it remained the same. If you take a travel agent that worked from, say, 1990 to 2010, they saw their entire field change with different hardware, different operating systems, different software. It requires an unprecedented level of change. Because of this, the base layer of education that we expect from many employees has risen. The bachelor's degree has kind of become the new high school diploma in terms of employment opportunities. You hear this negatively referred to sometimes as degree inflation. The idea that the more people have a particular level of education, the less valuable it is. This is a particularly important discussion in Canada where, as of 2012, we have the second highest level of education in the world. World. However, the actual character of, it, of our education has remained largely unchanged. Now, I'm not talking about massive open online courses or what we call MOOCs or revitalizing the lecture. I'm talking about what we learn and where we learn it. Right now, we're using a 1950s style curriculum in a 21st century world. Now, this is one of those things that led to uh, my research grant, which was funded by the AMS uh, here at UBC, where I'm looking at, and this is a bit dry, but I'm looking at the impact of government funding and support for multidisciplinary programs on regional rates of innovation. So pretty much this means when the government says it's great if our universities are teaching our engineers to study art and our artists to study biology, what does that do for how we invent? Uh, and my first step in this was to look at how and why people invent. And to that end, I'm going to tell you three stories. The story of the air conditioner, the story of the parachute, and the story of the webcam. The first is the story of the air conditioner, and please try to contain your excitement. Um, <laughs> the air conditioner was invented by a man named William Carrier in 1902. He was hired by a company that wanted to control temperature and humidity. He set out to create a device that could control temperature and humidity, and after years of research, he accomplished it. It's not the most thrilling story, but this is actually how we generally think of inventions. A problem is presented, somebody sits in a dark room for years, and then something's invented. There are changes along the way afterwards, but by and large, there's that aha moment, and then it's done. Uh, and this is actually how we structure our education system as well. We spend our elementary and high school years getting a base layer of education. Then as soon as we're in our bachelors, we have to specialize. We have to decide on what we do. Then we go into either a master's or the private sector, where we do research that has a target. We know what problem we're going to, we want to solve, and we go out and we solve it. But it turns out this actually isn't how invention usually works. The parachute was invented in 1783 by Louis Sebastien Lenormand, a full 120 years before manned flight made this invention actually useful. Now, he wasn't the first person to think about using an umbrella-like device to float down through the air, uh, back then off of air balloons or tall buildings for fun, I guess. Um, <laughs> but his idea actually didn't come from any of those European inventions. He was sitting in a French cafe where diplomats, scientists, artists would come together and they would talk about their experiences, they would talk about their ideas, and he heard of a diplomat who went to Thailand and saw an amazing Siamese acrobatic performance where, as part of the performance, the acrobat would float down on something that seemed very much like a parasol. Because this person, Lenormand, was in the right place to hear this story, uh, 
He invented something that has saved thousands of lives since. Now, it's very difficult to quantify these type of interactions, and Stephen Johnson does a very good job in his book, The History of Good Ideas, where he calls them liquid networks, places where people with, from different backgrounds and different ideas can just talk. And a surprising amount of what we invent comes from that. Now, the webcam is my favorite type of invention. The webcam was invented in 1991. Now, today, we use it to talk to our friends overseas, conduct interviews. Right now, you can use a webcam to see a real-time image off the International Space Station. Now, it was invented in 1991 because a group of researchers at Cambridge were way too lazy to walk all the way to another room to see if there was coffee. <laughs> I, I know I've had that problem myself. <laughs> um, it, and because of this, we have this world-changing technology. Because not only were they, did they want to make their lives a little bit better, but they had the resources available, they had leftover equipment, and they had time and they had freedom to use it. Now, just for, <laughs> for the record, this is the first ever image on the first ever webcam showing what is an empty coffee pot. <laughs> so this is not an invention that went to waste. Um, and a lot of the inventions that we have are because the resources are there. And it's not necessarily what you set out to do, but the materials are there for you and you're given the freedom to use them. Companies and universities are starting to take more advantage of this. Google, for instance, not only famously gives their employees time to experiment and have fun with uh, Google's um, incredible amount of money and technology and employees, but they also go out and they find humanities PhDs. They find ph philosophy PhD candidates and offer them jobs at Google. Because it turns out they make fantastic programmers. And it's not necessarily that they're better than their counterparts, but they see things in a different way. Because they come from a completely different field. They didn't come from programming, but it's something that they can do because they have, they have skill. But you don't really have to get to the PhD level to have that type of skill. First of all, not every PhD student is going to get hired by Google. Second of all, not all of us can take a PhD for reasons varying between skills or just the fact that it can be expensive. Not everybody has the time. Some of us have to find more paying work sooner. It's an economic reality. Because those people don't have the freedom earlier to experiment with different fields, there's wasted potential and there's wasted opportunity. So what can we do to fix this? Uh, the biggest thing is we can encourage our universities to create more multidisciplinary programs. Uh, programs that encompass different areas of business, different areas of politics, biology, engineering, physics, all of this uh, might not be useful to everyone in the first, say, two or three jobs they work, but there's another five after that. There are, <laughs> there are more career changes, there's more potential there, and you can still draw on things that you had before. These programs are crucial because we live in a new world where we are not going to have a job. We are not going to have a career, and it, is, it can be terrifying for us. And the more we're prepared, the more we're confident that you're not stuck in this narrow field, the better it'll be for all of us. Now, that's a big change. So what can we do on a personal level? The parachute and the webcam were invented because there were resources available and there were people available. If you have ideas, share them. If you have access to resources, see who else wants to play. The world can change because of a conversation, and you never know what you're going to inspire. I am sure that the Siamese acrobat who floated down through the air didn't think that he'd be creating something that was still saving lives hundreds of years afterwards. We don't know the effects of what we share or what we do. So why not share and why not talk and why not experiment with telling stories with each other? Thank you.